Thanks everyone for coming, whether you're here in person or with us on Zoom. My name is Kate Gibson. I'm the Associate Director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And we're very pleased to have Catherine Chang and Craig Thomas, both from the University of Washington, joining us for our event, Searching for Science in the Puget Sound Basin. Um, so just to give you a, um, a sense of our speakers today, Catherine Chang has been a PhD student at the University of Washington Evans School of Public Policy and Governance since 2020. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics and international affairs from the University of Georgia and a master's degree in agriculture and resource economics from UC Davis. Her research interests include participatory governance, civil society, and the use of knowledge in collaborative partnerships. Prior to joining Evans, Catherine worked with nonprofits in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and Athens, Georgia, and has conducted research as a Fulbright scholar in Brazil. Craig Thomas is a professor of public policy at the University of Washington at the Evans School. His research analyzes collaboration among public, private, and nonprofit stakeholders, with a particular focus on how science is used in collaborative decision-making processes for habitat conservation planning, watershed management, and marine ecosystem management. He holds a master in political science and a master's in public policy from UC Berkeley. So Catherine and Craig are joining us today to discuss their research, which focuses on how scientific research is valued, acquired, and applied in multi-stakeholder partnerships in the Puget Sound region of Western Washington. Their findings paint a curious picture of the interplay between science and politics in these partnerships. So thank you, Craig and Catherine, and um, we'll give you the floor. All right, thank you, Kate. And thank you all for coming and everybody in Zoom world. Let me just say, um, Catherine will come up second. Um, and I wanna start by acknowledging the co-PI on our project, Tom Coons, my longtime co-author. And he can't be here because he's on sabbatical in New Zealand, but hopefully he's watching. And I also wanna acknowledge, the, uh, we have three undergraduate research assistants, including uh, and plus the doctoral research assistant, Catherine, who will be up. And one of the great things about the National Science Foundation is they're really supportive of um, students getting into research. And we were um, fortunate to have three undergrads researchers who did a lot of work to get going on this project. It was surprising how hard it was just to figure out what's going on out there in terms of collaborative partnerships. And we're not <laughs> presenting what they gathered. We're gonna present somewhere in the middle and I'll, um, I'll load it up and show you where we're going. And again, thanks to the National Science Foundation for supporting this, but one of the things I'm gonna to do today is walk it back and show some of the research we've been working on that led up to the NSF grant. And then towards the end where we're going, I'm gonna do the framing part, and then Catherine's gonna come up and show you our data thus far. And these photos. So I'm just showing you various ways to get data. We often may think about it coming from big science like this, but a lot of data, including the Puget Sound, is what people call citizen science or community science. And one interesting thing is that these collaborative partnerships are looking for science that's localized and relying on um, volunteers to gather information. And we'll be referencing that. So, Home to us, Puget Sound, Seattle's right here. And one very interesting thing about Puget Sound is how incredibly complex it is in terms of different ecosystems, as well as the complexity of institutions. And I put collaborative partnerships in blue, I'm gonna to get to this, but I wanna lay out how these collaborative partnerships come about because they're voluntary and they're doing a lot and you don't really hear about them because they're not making the news but there's a lot of them and it took us a long time to find ones just doing ecosystem management. So ecosystem diversity, you got a lot of deep marine, uh, big, big marine mammals, lots of shipping coming in. Down here, you got a lot of mud flats. Up in various areas with all the water coming off the Cascades and the Olympics, you get a lot of um, ag land. There's just a lot going on. And plus you got all this institutional diversity and it's important 
in the Pacific Northwest in particular to talk about the tribal lands and treaty rights. There are 23 recognized, federally recognized tribes, and there's more that aren't um, federally recognized. And one of the things that these partnerships do is they are bringing in tribal um, stakeholders. And it's interesting to see how much traditional ecological knowledge they might be bringing in and, and how it's thought about. And there's a lot of private lands that are intermixed with these state and federal lands. They're being regulated. Federal regs are regulated state and local. Super complex. And you can't see that all here. And a key point is there's so much going on that any one actor can't um, address bigger picture things. But also one thing to point out with these collaborative partnerships is they're highly local. I mean, if we had a map and we plan to do this when we get done um, to show how they're populating all around here. It was hard enough just to find them. And I wanna point out, we are only focusing on marine and estuarine um, ecosystem restoration partnerships that plausibly can incorporate science. There's more that, I don't want to say plausibly don't, but they might be focused more on cleanups, um, where you can visually see things. We're, we want to focus on those that are pl plausibly using science because they're developing plans, projects, policy recommendations. And just to give you some images, um, you know, you got those shallow tide lands. You got aquaculture. This is oyster farming. We have some good oysters up there. This is some of the farmlands that were sitting on the um, estuary or meeting the ocean. Um, great farming. But this is what a lot of the Puget Sound looks like. Deeper, lots of little peninsulas coming out um, and islands. And I put the salmon up here, they're iconic in the Northwest. And I put the orca up here because they eat the salmon. They're the peak ecosystem, they're the charismatic megafauna. People focus on them, but they're an indicator species because if there's not enough salmon coming up of different species, it's due to a lot of things going on um, where the fresh water meets the, ocean, um, the salt water. So here we go, this is the layout. I'm going to Talk about the research motivation, why we do this, why we're excited, why I've been doing this for years, focusing on science and collaborative partnerships. I'm gonna load it up with some of the prior research findings we have, um, talk about the current research project, where we are in it, and then Catherine's gonna show you the fun stuff where we now have results. And it's not complete, but we definitely see interesting patterns. Motivation, why are we doing this? When I was a political science student and public policy student, I was taught and we saw that agencies were trying to manage within their jurisdictions. And we know a lot about what the, um, there's a lot of research on how agencies incorporate science and they're required to in federal and state environmental impact statements courts have adjudicated all sorts of stuff about how science has to be in decision analyses and administrative law, which governs regulatory policy making and public health. I'm just giving you examples, but we know a lot. We know the patterns in the public agencies. We know very little about how science is being incorporated in these collaborative partnerships. I'm gonna define them in a moment. And this is very important because Public agencies, state and federal, are delegating decision-making authority to these partnerships. And they're doing it for reasons I'll come to. And it's very important that we have some idea of what they're doing with regard to finding, using, interpreting science, because stuff is moving a bit sideways from agencies. And I want to put it in, you put it in context. I'm not saying they're doing anything that's you know against um, administrative law or anything. It's just a, the sense that the, the diffusion of, of responsibility in public policy and management is leading to these partnerships and other things seem to be going on. And we have to track this because one of the critiques of collaborative partnerships um, by people who've been winning in court and suing and, and thinking that this is a good way to move forward is that a lot of this collaborative partnerships is, or they're 
you know, it's like kumbaya, kumbaya, everybody is getting along now, which is great. Um, and I'm optimistic about that, um, particularly in our civil society today. But there's a, there's a lot of people are wondering whether all these diverse stakeholders with diverse interests, not all of whom are scientists, maybe a smaller portion of them are scientists, are coming with different ways of knowing like traditional ecological knowledge coming from tribes, but also TEK, traditional ecolog ecological knowledge from family farming that, and aquaculture that have been there for generations, who can bring in perspectives about baseline uh, conditions for which um, we don't have the science. So that's the motivation. And I just, again, I wanna set it up. Um, this idea of wicked problems, this is actually in the literature we have people often use this term, but to public policy folks, environmental policy, we tend to think that wicked environmental problems tend to have these components. It's not clear what the problem is because people are debating the problem. Maybe they never actually figure out exactly an agreement on the problem. They're differing on the solutions and sometimes you can get people to agree on the solutions even though they define the problem differently. You have all these overlapping jurisdictions so nobody can fully resolve anything and a lot of scientific uncertainty. I just give a simple example here. Here's somebody who appears to have um, armored their own beach, but there's a lot of shoreline armoring where it's cement and riprap for roads. And the beaches get armored like this to protect the shoreline. And this person in their yard probably wants that. There's big consequences. You know, the eelgrass, which is like the kelp along the coast here, it's a major ecosystem in the Puget Sound in shallower areas, it just goes away because you don't have all of the movement that would produce the eel grass and the smell, or um, all the fish that would be attached to it. But it's not clear what to do about it. I mean, this might be illegal, you can go knock it down, but what are you gonna do to remove other kinds of armoring and where do you wanna put it? Sea level's rising. Maybe the armoring is good in some places. It's just, this is a small thing, but it's not obvious what to do about it. And there's a lot of scientific uncertainty. If you armor something somewhere, where does the sand go? Does the eelgrass appear? Um, this is a wicked problem. That example is super local. Um, so we're talking bigger scales than this, but still um, fairly local and regional. So how do you deal with wicked problems like this? Well, some people really want you to regulate like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of Ecology in Washington State and just order people to do things. Command and control, smack them on the head. And you know, some people will win that way. Some people will wanna sue under all sorts of laws, including federal and state legislation. Um, but that doesn't always give you some sort of a win-win strategy. And you can compensate people payment for ecosystem services, tax credits, all sorts of stuff, but that'll get things on the margin. And by the way, I'm not saying any of these are bad, but um, you may not be solving the things you care about. And then come these voluntary collaborative partnerships. And I just wanna call out here, we're gonna call them partnerships just as a term and I'll define it, but this is part of the hard thing of finding them because they're under all sorts of names. Sometimes they're called an organization. They might be called any of these terms and others. And sometimes they might call themselves a partnership and you look at it and it's really not a collaborative. Um, they're just, and so it takes a lot of time and the undergrads helped us by finding more than a hundred. And then we had to keep winnowing it down to see what we wanted. And we had to investigate them until we got our sample. More on that in a bit. So research questions. Right now, this is our big one. It's just, and all of these questions are empirically descriptive. And we're not gonna present any of the causal associational data today, but I want you to see the patterns to see what's going on. And um, we've started to do that. Um, how do these partnerships value? You know, for what purposes? Why are they trying to find science? What value do they place on it? And by the way, across different kinds of partnerships and across different kinds of stakeholders because we're interviewing people. How do they acquire it? What barriers get in their way? How do they overcome the barriers? This is a big problem. Um, how do they evaluate it so once they get it, how is it usable or not? They might finally get it and then look at it and think, oh, what do we do with it? 
Um, and then how do they apply it? Meaning how do they incorporate it into decisions for plans, projects, policy recommendations? And these are the, I only put these secondary questions up because these are the ones Catherine's going to address. You know, so why are they after it? How do they find it in general? What sources do they ultimately draw upon? What are the obstacles in getting the stuff they want? And how do they get it over the obstacles? So just a general definition. This is the big academic definition of what collaborative governance is, because this is such a big phenomenon crossing all sorts of issue areas, particularly environment, because there's so many wicked problems. But this is a standard, this is a definition people cite a lot. It's the processes and structures of policy decision making and management. So keep in mind these are voluntary. So it's not that people are not necessarily being told to do this, but these processes and structures, these organizations become formalized, they get delegated authority, um, and they're working constructively. That's you know, they want to work constructively because they're trying to do something across all these boundaries, and this is key, to carry out a public purpose that cannot otherwise be accomplished. We brought the definition down to the scale we want to talk about how partnerships use science. Collaborative governance is this phenomenon, and then there's partnerships, and we defined it this way to develop management plans, recommendations, and policy recommendations, because it's very instrumental. This is when you would think um, science would be incorporated. And so we narrowed it, and that way, we, of all the um, types of collaborative partnerships we found, that, or excuse me, the undergrads found, and we discussed with them, we wanted to winnow it to those that are plausibly using science, and we would think should be. So let me just start with some language, and Catherine then is going to give you our data. Um, so this is largely from the public agency literature. There's a big literature on how public agencies use science. Um, conceptual, and by the way, the literature basically shows that public agencies do conceptual more than instrumental, which is surprising because a lot of what's in the documents are just conceptualizing the problem, the boundaries of the problem, what should we do, creating frameworks, Instrumental means once you have an idea of what you want to do, you have a goal, what are you going to do about it? Um, so what is your management tool? What's your policy tool or instrument? This is language from academics. Um, and then symbolic. This is what we worry about. And in public agencies, there's a fair amount of symbolic use of politics. Um, cherry picking is the one we can think of the most. We see it in the news all the time. You're cherry picking, you're cherry picking. You're finding the science you, that answers the question you want, but also there's a, we should be concerned about the possibility people are going through the motions. And when a push comes to shove, the science they don't think would actually push the decision. Um, and Catherine will present data on what we found. So I just want to show you, just um, walk you through what got us to this project. So in a prior study, we found, we did, um, this, uh, me and a couple other people, coded 30 case studies of marine partnerships. So the case studies might be really long, even book length or chapter length or article length, and coded, for, um, and what we're gonna show you today is content analysis coding, had seven measures for use of science, the various ways you could use it, a bunch of measures for stakeholder engagement and collaborative processes, meaning deliberative, and it was really clear, the more stakeholder engagement, the bigger, wider the diversity of participation, the longer you do it, the more you talk, the more use of science across seven metrics. And this is kind of surprising because there's this argument out there that collaborative partnerships are going to water down because they have to find some common denominator to agree on. But that's you know, folk knowledge. And so we did this with the case studies. Yet, in another study with Tom Kuntz, who's the co-PA on this project, my longtime co-author, so then we went in and raked a bunch of collaborative group um, products, um, particularly the plans that they produced to do something, and looked at their citations. And remarkably few are from what 
people at Stanford might expect, and the University of Washington and other academics. Citations to peer-reviewed scholarly um, publications. Citing heavily um, the gray literature. Partic gray means some things we respect but aren't necessarily peer-reviewed in academic journals. They might be peer-reviewed, particularly state and federal agencies, but they're not necessarily documents and data, but they're not necessarily required to do that. But that's clearly where they're getting a lot of this from. And we'll talk that through. So then the question is why? And I think our data will show why. Um, in another study with Tyler Scott, a while back, we did a survey of collaborative partnerships. And I'm gonna show you different ways of thinking about these partnerships in terms of the state role in encouraging them. And the survey found that the more capacity building an agency does of the partnerships, like more technical assistance, more, res more financial resources, more staff time kicked into the partnership. Curiously, yes, it's a good thing, it helps, but there is a spin-off effect. The more people in the partnerships network with other partnerships. Um, very clear. And we had the baseline of those partnerships at that time that weren't being capacity built by state agencies. Um, so there's something going on. I think our data will start to explain it. Why it would be that capacity building, which is not necessarily meant to have all this networking, um, leads to it. And networking is a good thing, because as we'll show, it has to do with, in part, the diffusion of knowledge. So that was a head scratcher. And so this is our question. You know, we found these patterns, you know, what's going on, and more. So this is where we're at. I just want to set this up for this particular project. Most of what I showed you before was before the project. You know, the undergrads helped us cataloging all the Partnerships, we hope to create documents that will have, help everybody find each other, um, an online platform. We had to winnow down more than 100 partnerships, and we got to 64 that we thought were really appropriate, and then winnow it down more for the interviews, because the interview findings are going to help us create the survey, and then the survey is going to go to the members of all partnerships of the 64 that we think for ecosystem restoration and tidal, marine, estuarine, ecosystems um, that we want to see. And therefore, you know, because the qualitative methods we're going to show you are very inductive, um, and it's tricky to do. Um, surveys are deductive. We write the questions and create the buckets because we, we think we know what we want to find. And so this, we're at the stage now of um, analyzing the interview um, transcripts and this is a big end goal for us. We want to learn all this stuff, help people find each other, and develop practical tools that would help people find, use, apply science. And again, it's voluntary, but these, all these people are having different kinds of problems, and we'll show you what our data shows. So let me just set this up, and then Catherine will come in. In the literature, um, this kind of framing is, exists for collaborative partnerships. You can have government-led ones where they, a government agency acts as the convener or several government agencies will act as a convener and bring people in and kind of run things. They might feel a little bit oppressive to other stakeholders and it kind of might feel, even if it's not more like the agencies kind of know what they want. Um, we don't have those in our sample. We could later. We got these three. We want to get more community-based, but a community base is the opposite. It's bubbling up. People at some local community level, even more regional, are realizing that if we all got together, then we can solve something. In between are these. This is, these are the ones I've tended to focus on more. Government encouraged, and a lot of this means capacity building, as I mentioned before, meaning the government agency and the actors within it will see these partnerships and think, um, this is cool, this is good stuff. Um, let's um, feed them data. Let's feed them staff time. Let's give them some money to get together 
um, for and have donuts or whatever. And so it's capacity building. That's why we call it government encourage. And I want to call this out now. Um, we have two types we focused on in these interviews. There's more. Um, one are these local integrating organizations. Again, language, they call themselves that. There's a whole bunch of them. We picked four because we were doing pairwise in different regions. Um, so it sounds like some organization, but it's actually a collaborative partnership for a purpose because they're expected to do ecosystem recovery plans and then they're fed cookies and things. That's a, um, to get them, coax them in that direction. If you start to do, produce this, we'll help you. Then they got this, uh, and this is coming from state encouragement. Um, these marine resource committees, these are come with um, federal encouragement. I don't wanna go into all the details of how this works. But the important thing is these are county-based, so every county in that area has them, there's a bunch. We focused on three in the data we're gonna show you. And one might think that because these are planning-based, these are policy advisory, these are coming up from the community, and we did this on purpose, thinking there must be a pattern that they're gonna be doing differently. Uh, the data says otherwise, no, no noticeable differentiation. Um, so when you see the data Catherine's gonna have and it, it shows you, oh, well, you know, we're using it for the purpose of developing um, plans and, and such, these people are as likely to do it as the others. Um, so I just want to keep that in mind. I don't wanna go into the details of all these different types, but I do wanna load this up. So when Catherine shows you the data, um, one thing people might think is, oh, well, the data varies because you got different types of organizations. It also doesn't seem to vary, though we haven't looked into it enough with the stakeholders we interviewed because we purpose, purposefully sampled a set of um, five uh, members of partnerships who'd been around a long time and you know, tried to get tribal representatives, local government, sometimes elected, local elected officials, local state federal agency planning people. You know, we couldn't have it all matched across, but create as much diversity um, within these organizations. Again, with the presumption, you're going to see a lot of um, diversity. And thus far, it doesn't jump out. And this speaks to this idea that collaborative partnerships are bringing people together for a long time. They're sharing lots of information. They're jointly coming to some resolution and they all start to speak the same in some sense. And so Catherine will help you, help me, <laughs> think this through. Um, Tom, Koontz, and I, and Catherine jointly coded all this stuff together, super hard, and Catherine will talk about the methods. So I'm gonna make a transition here, um, but just to point out, so this is a traditional way of doing content analysis before we had all this computer-assisted stuff. So she's gonna walk through how it looks on um, a platform. MaxQDA is one, and Catherine did a lot of research and compared these other ones I've used like Atlas TI and Invivo and RQDA. There's all of these platforms. And this one um, we thought was super cool. And so if you're thinking about doing content analysis, it may cost more, but there's a reason a Tesla is, I shouldn't say an e-golf, my wife has an e-golf. You know, it has more going on. Um, and again, this is just 38 interviews so far. It took a long time to code because of all the reconciliation. This is not final data, but there are clear patterns. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to Catherine, one of our co-authors and our doctoral student. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Um, Okay, so Craig just gave you a lot of the background on our project, and I'm now gonna jump into our initial findings. And so we just talked about how a lot of our data analysis is done in MaxQDA, and we really um, we compared different softwares and we really liked this one. Okay, so to begin, uh, I first wanna delve a little bit into content analysis, which is the main method that we use to come to our findings. So once we have our interviews transcribed and proofread, they're all cleaned up. Uh, we drop them into that MaxQDA software and we begin the coding process. So to develop our codebook, uh, we develop it iteratively. We develop it while we code, essentially. 
And the first thing we do is we set these broad topics or themes, um, which usually correspond to questions that we ask them. As we read interviews and um, we see how they respond, that helps us to uh, populate the vast majority of our code book. For many of you who are familiar, this is known as an inductive coding process. Uh, so you can see um, it's demonstrated on this right-hand panel here. This is just a small snippet, a screenshot of a bit of our code book in MaxQDA. Uh, so at the top, you see that obstacles to finding science is shown in blue. So that's this broad theme we're working with. And then these purple nodes here, that shows you the codes or kind of typical responses that we see. So the way to think about these codes is they operate like buckets. Um, as we keep reading interviews, we start seeing similar responses, right? And if when we see something that we've already seen before, we simply drop that transcript, transcript or that coded segment of the interview into the code bucket. And those are those numbers you see on this rightmost side here. So that tells us how full the bucket is and ultimately allows us to identify trends and patterns in what we're, what we're interested in, right? So as you can imagine, uh, Dr. Thomas and I are quite different people and we may interpret a passage differently, right? And so how we deal with that is we use a reconciliation process whereby we have three coders. So we have myself, we have Dr. Thomas and we have Dr. Kuntz and we rotate pairs. So every transcript is coded by two people. We put those transcripts together and we calculate a, um, a proportion of agreement. So on average, we generally agree on about 67% of the codes in a transcript. The rest of that um, are disagreements that we come to the table and we have a discussion and we decide what the interviewee is ultimately saying. In rare cases, there's times when uh, we have difficulty agreeing on what they're saying. And in that case, we bring in that third coder uh, to break the tie. So that reconciliation process is really helpful for establishing the final transcript, which we use in our analysis. All right, so I'm now gonna jump into our findings and I'm gonna begin by introducing this question, which was originally motivated by that gap in the literature, right? Where we know quite a bit about how public agencies use science, but we don't know that much about how collaborative partnerships do. So we know that public agencies use quite a bit of conceptual use of science. So defining problems, exploring them, a little bit of instrumental use, so filling gaps to achieve a goal. And they use symbolic use as well, meaning that the politicization of science does indeed happen. And we're interested in whether we see the same thing in collaborative partnerships, because that is an alternate governance arrangement. So I first want to draw your attention to this photo here. Uh, this is what's called a derelict vessel. And I bring it up because it is an example project that a lot of our interviewees mentioned. Um, derelict vessels are when a vessel essentially is um, stranded or neglected. Um, it, when it sinks, it can cause a lot of issues. It can block waterways, it can leak pollution. And so this is one of the projects that um, many of our interviewees are working on and it can be quite a challenging project. And those are examples that they use in their interviews. All right, uh, so these are our findings. Um, we indeed see something different. And I first wanna go back and kind of reiterate what each of these mean. Uh, so by conceptual uses, this is when science is used to define a problem and oftentimes understand its scope. So say, finding the causes and consequences of derelict vessels, right? Perhaps understanding the scope, so how many derelict vessels exist in the region. And then instrumental use. In contrast, this is using science to fill gaps or to achieve a goal, right? So let's say they've decided to remove the derelict vessels instead of just managing it, right? They would be using science to fill gaps. So what is the best way to do that, right? And other relevant questions. And then there's symbolic uses, which again is that often seen as problematic, right? This is this politicization. So our interviewees don't mention any symbolic use. Right. And it's important to remember here that we don't prompt them on these particular uses. Right. So it really is just free response. Um, but they don't mention symbolic use at all. It's possible that if we ask them, you know, quite clearly, does politicization of science happen? They might say yes, but we don't see it in our results. And then instrumental. This also stands out to us because we see very, very high amounts of instrumental use in collaborative partnerships, which we don't normally see in public agencies. So some reasons why we might see this. Uh, so one is that um, we might see less politicization because collaborative partnerships have this unique mechanism of deliberation, whereby interviewees or our members in these organizations um, might be coming to the table, bringing information, being more transparent with it. Uh, so that is kind of collectively evaluating information. 
bringing assumptions to the table, perhaps prior beliefs, and perhaps this enhanced transparency serves as a check on potential politicization. So why do we see such high instrumental use? So one reason is that collaborative partnerships, uh, they're not only involved in developing plans and proposals, but also they're very close to implementing them in their specific locality. And so those instrumental questions, those goal-oriented questions can be really important. I also want to just mention, uh, you'll notice that we have 38 interviews in total, but obviously 35 plus 15 doesn't equal 38. And so it's important to remember that in this process, uh, respondents or interviewees can say as many um, responses as they want. So they may use both instrumental and conceptual use. Okay, so I'm now showing you kind of what's in these broad themes. These are typical responses or codes that we see from our interviewees. I also want to briefly state that um, I'm about to show you quite a few bar graphs and just how to interpret them. Um, Remember that this doesn't work like a survey, so they can respond with as many responses as they want. And so they may respond with various responses and therefore be counted in various categories. And that's why these percentages don't add up to 100 totally. And then on the x-axis, that is the proportion of our interviewees who mentioned this particular response. So by far, uh, they're using science instrumentally to develop strategies, plans, and proposals. So here you see them doing a lot of things like using science to um, identify priority areas, um, perhaps projects for funding. And you also see, see things like advising policymakers and non-governmental stakeholders. So just briefly, something that was interesting to us was that remember that those local integrating organizations that Craig mentioned, they are formed with the intention of developing plans. And so we would expect for them mostly to be in this developing strategies, plans, proposals category. Similarly, we would see that marine resource councils, who often serve an advisory function, making policy recommendations, would be in advising policymakers. However, that's actually not the case. We see pretty widespread across the organizations. In other words, we don't see a big difference in what, what, um, what codes they mention, right? And so these organizations can be engaged in perhaps a wider range of activities than we would normally think about. Just briefly, advising policymakers, that's providing policy recommendations. And as far as non-governmental stakeholders go, this may be, say, providing technical assistance to landowners or even public education. And then at the bottom, you see some lesser mentioned codes. All right, so conceptual use. Um, these bars, they look quite a bit wider, but that doesn't necessarily indicate anything different. It just means that there are less responses or codes in this category. So we see that problem definition or scoping is by far the biggest conceptual use. So using science to often understand the causes and consequences of a problem, but also to define its boundaries, that is a scoping. All right, so I just talked a bit about the supply side, I mean the demand side of science. I now wanna talk about the supply side of science. And so I'm asked, starting by asking them, what are the strategies to find science? In other words, where do you turn when you're searching for it? And consistent with prior literature, particularly literature um, by uh, Dr. Thomas uh, and um, some former PhD students, uh, getting from others is usually the first strategy that they use. These relational networks are really, really important. Um, and this also, you know, it it's kind of inspires thoughts about, well, what is it about getting it through other people that may make it particularly beneficial? And one reason is that other people are engaged in sort of a brokering mechanism. So perhaps helping them narrow in on what's really important or even translating science into a form that's relatively understandable. And then second, we see that internet search is other, another really uh, common category. Obviously, about 60% of our interviewees mention using it, just going on the internet and searching. All right, so because we have such rich interview data, these rich interview data, uh, these are quite in depth. Um, this allows us to dig deeper into each of these categories. So we ask them, okay, you get from other people, how is it that that happens, right? What is that process like? And we find that conferences and meetings are by far really, really beneficial, right? Over 60% of our interviewees mention it. But this second category in particular, I think really piques our interest, this get from others that they know. So what that means is that they're really reaching out to their own networks um, outside of their partnership, right? 
It's important to remember that uh, collaborative governance, I mean collaborative partnerships, remember that they're really intentionally trying to have members with very diverse backgrounds and networks. And this is interesting because it highlights this feature of collaborative partnerships that perhaps they have access to a wider range of networks than say maybe a public agency, which may have more insular networks with a homogenous um, group of people, right? So then regarding internet search, uh, this study gave us this really unique opportunity to study how they use the internet a little bit because the internet is something that's still relatively new, so we don't understand that much from prior, prior research about how decision makers use the internet to find information for these decisions. So by far, obviously, we see just very generic responses. They say, you know, I use the internet, I search the internet, or I Google it, right? But for those who are a little bit more detailed, you can see the second set of rows here um, where they're a bit more specific. So, uh, they're using databases, government websites, and some crowdsourced sites such as like ResearchGate, for instance. But I think what's interesting here is the database part, because what was surprising, at least to me, was that many of these interviewees are mentioning using raw data. And that's something that I don't think we normally think about in this sort of field of study. Um, being, perhaps suggests that there is this sort of extra added level of expertise that is needed, the skill of being able to work with data. And you see that reflected in many of our interviews. So here this interviewee is talking about how, you know, they may have the data, they may have the GIS data, for instance, but they need a really badass GIS person who knows how to use it. Because ArcGIS is a monster, right? And you see similar things throughout the interviews. Okay, so, I'm now at, so now I'm going to uh, talk about the sources of science. So we asked them, all right, we know how you get it, but what are the sources that you end up using? And also consistent with prior research, um, practitioner publications are the most common. Um, as academics, we're of course puzzled. Well, why is scholarly publications at the bottom, right? These, these are peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, and then we see uh, that other sources is also really common, and I'll talk more about that in a few slides. Okay, so what is practitioner publications? Uh, so this is, um, as Dr. Thomas mentioned earlier, uh, what we oftentimes call gray literature, right? So it may be very respected, but it's not, it's oftentimes not peer reviewed, right? So um, when we, and of course we have gray literature here at the bottom, but that's really when they mention sort of generically, I use gray literature. So by far, we see that amongst practitioner sources, they're drawing on government docs and data. And this finding is particularly interesting and timely right now, especially as you know, we have calls or for, say, more transparent government, more open government, and you start seeing more things like um, you know, the release of open data portals and things like that, especially on the local level. This research shows that that can potentially be really important for these types of collaborative partnerships. So then regarding other types, uh, this is something interesting and I don't think we really expect it because we oftentimes think of, um, so we often think of collaborative partnerships as engaged mainly in developing plans and proposals and also implementing them. However, here we see that actually many of them are engaged in internally producing their own research. So conducting science themselves, say gathering data. So the majority of um, of interviewees who mentioned other types are you doing it internally. So this is when their partnership is internally, is conducting internal research just within their organization. And this often includes things like monitoring their current projects. They also do it in conjunction with other organizations and individuals, and that's this co-production category. And that usually means um, that they're doing it, say, in partnership with, with a member's home organization, perhaps a government agency, um, and it also includes citizen science or community science um, as Craig talked, to, or talked about earlier. And then this bottom here, presentation materials. This doesn't fit cleanly in any of our other categories, but this is things like conference presentations. Okay, so I'm now gonna jump into talking about the obstacles to accessing science. And this picture will make more sense in a bit. Um, but I want to mention first that, you know, we know what sources they use, but the sources that they use might be different than the sources they value, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that those are the sources that are most valuable or most beneficial for what they're doing, 
right? And so, you know, for instance, we didn't see a lot of use of scholarly publications, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those aren't useful. It may mean that they face particular barriers to accessing them. And so we asked them, you know, what, what obstacles do you face most? Uh, we see that um, the majority of, of people who mention obstacles mention that cost constraints are particularly challenging. And there's a few types of cost constraints that um, really stand out to us, sort of three main types. So we see that high journal subscription costs is a big one. Um, here, this interviewee, she works for a tribal government. And she's talking about how the tribal government just simply doesn't have the resources to um, pay those subscription costs. And so um, they simply don't access those peer-reviewed journal articles, right? The second category here is insufficient funding for research. Uh, you'll remember that internally produced research in particular was really common and important for things like monitoring performance, perhaps making changes, right? And so in some cases, that process of starting the monitoring and maintaining it um, is really expensive. And they just simply don't have the funds to do that. And then the third type, um, you'll remember that as far as strategies um, and getting from other people, conferences and meetings were really important um, for those relational networks cultivated at those conferences and meetings were important for getting information. And here, uh, this interviewee reminds us that in many cases, these partnerships, um, the members are voluntary. They're acting as private citizens, and therefore, they're not compensated for attending those. So I now want to come back to this same bar graph here um, and jump to the second row, which is too much science to sift through. And this, uh, this code was really interesting to us because it starts, it starts being reflected in some of the later findings that we find. So too much science to sift through is sort of this broad theme whereby you oftentimes have the science, and, but you're having a hard time just narrowing in on what's really important. Um, if any of you have done a broad search on Google Scholar, for instance, you know this process, right, of reading through abstracts and finding, identifying what you really need, what's going to work for your cause, right? And that's sort of the process that they're describing here. So what this may indicate to us is that there is perhaps a need for um, some way to narrow in on that research, what's really salient, right? In other words, it may be mentioning that sort of um, have building the capacity to broker knowledge could be really important. And that brings me to, my, to, our, next, um, to our next set of findings, mm -hmm. which regards the bridges to overcome those obstacles. And what was interesting to us is that remember that these interviews were not prompting them to these particular codes, um, was that this idea of a curated repository was really popular. It kept coming up in interviews in different forms, but sort of talking about the same idea. So what would these curator repositories look like? What are they really wanting, right? And so first off, um, this first interviewee is mentioning how um, there needs to be a place where they can share information. Um, the Marine Resource Councils, for instance, they're scattered all over our region, doing very similar things in many cases. But they actually don't talk to each other, which is interesting. And so a place to share information could be really helpful for avoiding instances of, say, reinventing the wheel or doing um, you know, all, whole new research that you could just ask your other Marine Resource Council, right? And then secondly, um, they really need information to be readily available, particularly free, right? Or at least low cost, const low cost constraints, right? And then also understandable. And this is also reflected in a lot of our findings, right? This thing about how it can be really helpful to have information summarized. Remember that these partnerships really intentionally have stakeholders or members with different backgrounds, so non-scientific and scientific backgrounds. And so if you're going to talk to each other and come to consensus on these plans, you need to, you need that, you need to have that, uh, it to be summarized so that everyone can understand and communicate about that information, right? It reduces this whole sifting process, as the interviewee says. OK, so before I jump into our uh, last set of findings, um, I want to come back to these purposes for science. Because re you'll remember that the instrumental use was by far the most common. And that is signaling to us that it may be really important for collaborative partnerships 
to be able to bridge the research, the research to practice divide, right? So to be able to apply science. In other words, we should be asking not only do they have access to science, but also do they have the capacity to apply it? Because that opens up these other questions about, you know, when you're applying science, what else is necessary? Who do you need to talk to? What other uh, features of the information do you need to have, right? And so we asked them, um, quite simply, what are the obstacles you face in applying science? And our research goes much deeper into this question, but I, first, I just want to present a tidbit for the sake of time. So we got a really wide range of responses, um, but this poor understandability was a really common uh, trend or theme that we kept seeing. So what's in that? So when we looked closer, uh, what they're talking about is a few things. So most often they're saying that it's group members lack expertise. This is group members within their group, right? And the ability to understand the scientific information that they're working with. And then you see the set of codes below it, which mainly have to do with science communication. The ability to um, communicate science from, say, a scientific to a non-scientific audience. And so what each of those look like, or the two main ones. Uh, so as far as um, group members lack expertise. So here they're talking about how you know, it may take a particular expertise to be able to interpret the information, but also to apply it. Right? If you've ever read an article from, say, biology, uh, you may say, OK, that's really cool. But is it going to work in the place where I live? Right? And it may take um, not only expertise, but even experience to know how to do that. And then secondly, uh, this is another common code, and that's just science is overly complex. And this is something important, these science communication codes in general, um, because remember that if you're a biologist in the partnership, trying to communicate to, say, uh, your city councilman and your um, landowner right, about how to implement a policy, it's really important to be able to convey why science is important, um, what it means, and how it's going to make a difference for them. right? So now just to distill, uh, I've just presented a lot of key takeaways, and here are just the implications of our findings. So you'll remember that um, cost constraints was the biggest obstacle to accessing science. And so what this tells us is that it's really important to make these resources freely available. right? So uh, in particular, things like journal firewalls um, can be really challenging. And it reinforces uh, policies for open access. right? This is telling you that open access is making a difference. It can for these partnerships. You also remember that as far as sources, uh, very, very often they were consulting government docs and data. And this also reinforces or strengthens um, this idea of having um, more open government or transparent government um, and things like open data portals. And then second, you remember that when it comes to applying research, remember many of them are engaged in applying it on the ground, bridging that research to practice divide. Um, understandability is hugely, hugely important. right? If you're applying science, uh, you probably need to talk to a number of people who are going to be involved. right? And so you need to be able to communicate it. So in asking, you know, how do, how do, what are ways that we can do that, um, a few things come to mind for these interviewees. So as far as structures, a curator repository would help, right? A central place where they can not only share information, but that information is summarized in a way that's understandable. But then as far as people, it also means that perhaps you should have individuals not only with scientific expertise, but also science communication skills as well, right? And then lastly, um, because we see so much drawing upon raw data, the ability of, to work with data, data skills can be really important. And this is an exciting time for that, because with things like more open data and whatnot, um, there are these intermediary support organizations which may be involved in sort of helping um, build those skills, say providing training and whatnot. So that actually concludes our talk. I thank you very much for your attention and your time, and we are open to any questions that you have. Hello. Hi, I have a question, and I'm not sure if you're talking about the community-based organization or the government agencies that we said. They use science to develop priorities, but I often find that the smaller community-based ones are membership and fundraising driven. And if the, those priorities come from the very strong end, there's months of thinner both for years. 
and how did you work that into your model? I'll take a shot at that. So the question, if I can restate it um, correctly, is a number of these um, partnerships are driven by fundraising, so membership fees, for example. And as it turns out, because of the way we scoped it, those fell away. Because a lot of those were things like Friends of the Beach, friend of the fish, Friends of the Fish Hatchery. And the partnerships and it, that fell into this way we defined it, um, those were typically not membership funding driven. And as I noted, there was those government encouraged ones. And those were um, important because government agencies acted in that capacity building way, sometimes with funding, sometimes with technical staff. And that's one of the reasons we constrained our um, definition, but it also led to those types of partnerships that are membership driven and fundraised. They fell away, they exist, but they tended not to get in our sample. And therefore um, I can answer a question just by saying, and I don't want to say we got rid of them. They just sort of fell away because they're doing other things. Like um, I'll just leave it at that, but it's a great question. Question here? Yes, I was fascinated. Um, my question, I actually have uh, two questions. One is, uh, especially since you mentioned this understatability obstacle, to what of your thoughts or do any of these organizations and collaborative entities have scientific bias? And so what are your thoughts on those in general? And then the other one is, did you? When you were, and I missed the first part of your talk, but ecological science out of very well, oh, like natural sciences, were you also including social science in your discussion of science? So it seems like that's really important also for, or these kinds of organizations, the collaborative entities. How do you really best work and policies and all that? Yes, we have answers to both. Do you want to take a shot at the first one? Yeah. Or I'll, so I'll address the social science part. So here we are talking about natural science for the most part, so biology, ecology. We have another part of our study which we haven't presented today, but drawing on like what type of political information, economic and whatnot, um, but it's separate. Thank you. And, and also we took a broad definition of science and we would prompt at the very beginning of the interviews by saying by science, we mean the systematic collection of data and analysis of it, but we didn't say, it had to be um, biologists. It could be social scientists, um, but mostly it came out as um, what we would think about in this building um, as um, bio of natural sciences. And to the other question about science advisory boards, that's a great question in part because of the diversity of these partnerships. And so some of these partnerships get big and they stratify. And so some of them will have an executive or a political committee, which is the one that's aggregating the political preferences and talking out to the city, you know, it might be the city planning people talking out back to their local elected officials. And then they might stratify it to a technical or scientific advisory committee. And so partnership diversity again matters. But the Marine Resources Committee that um, are mostly advisory to begin with, um, they're, they don't stratify in that way. They're, um, so, and they don't necessarily populate with scientists that themselves, they're trying to make that kind of technical connection, but sometimes they do. And often it's a bunch of retired scientists from the University of Washington. Um, so that's a really important because sometimes you get this very formalized stratification of committees and sometimes they're much smaller and it sort of catches catch can to see who comes in. This kind of thing is a lot, so it's such an interesting and important topic. A kind of a question I have is how about your staff with new graduates gave you a hundred or so collaborative partnerships and then you're sat Y38. And then the earlier question was about what well, about the membership driven type of organization, but they probably were not part of the 38. Just curious a little bit if you can talk about just the process of your staff 
approach and strategies and what were some of the criteria I used. It sounded like ultimately it was still a pretty diverse. Yeah, so you got this multi-level um, sampling. There's a sampling at the level of the partnerships and the um, undergrads helped us build up this catalog and then we worked with them about differentiation of types to speak to the previous question. And once we did that, we got to the 64 partnerships at that meso level of analysis and then we sampled within them going for you know roughly five um, people and we used key informants, often the coordinators, because we, we would call them up um, and say, um, you, you've been around for a while, who are the people we should talk to? Who's been around for a long time? And that doesn't mean we want all scientists. We want, because a lot of these have tribal reps, some of them have two different tribes in them. You know, we want people who've been around, who are different, who are scientists, retired, agency folks, elected. And so it's purposive sampling at the organizational level and the individual level. We're just trying to create diversity, but non-random purposive. Did you want to add to that? We have a couple of questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, the first is, sorry if I missed this detail, but in the government encouraged partnerships, did you find that the bulk of the science was provided to the partnership via government agencies? Did the government filter the science that groups make use of? Also, thank you both for the great talk. So everybody on Zoom just heard what Kate said, so I won't repeat it. Um, our interviews, you remember they're, they're free left listing based upon our questions. And interestingly, they, I don't think anybody said anything. Uh, they're searching for it, but we know that there are these government agencies, we've studied them, who are sending science down. Um, but it's interesting when we ask them where they're getting it from, even though they're getting it from government docs data, it didn't come up that there's some intentionality by agencies to send them specific things, but we know they are. And that doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. Um, it just means that you have these capacity building agencies that are trying to get data and spread it around. So, um... It, at some point, or have you already looked at the relationship between the things that you're looking at in terms of the sources of information and the activities of the particular organizations? Are they trying to, you know, just keep abreast of what's going on in the particular ecology they're interested in? Are they trying to change government policy? Are they, you know, what, what in other words, you would think that what you're using the information for and why you want it and what's relevant is relevant to what they're trying to do with what they're trying to do. So do you classify these organizations by what they're trying to do and are there any interesting relationships that have popped out of that? I'll, I'll just respond quickly to Bruce's question and then you can talk about co-occurrences and how we think about them. Um, so this gets to correlational what correlational ideas and statistics but in content analysis we think about it in terms of co-occurrences and we didn't ex we didn't give any co-occurrences but i mentioned that before in a prior study um that's what you know we're seeing co-occurrences between use of science and stakeholder engagement and in this case it's you know potential co-occurrences about their purposes with who they are these are considered variables demographics and stuff and so we didn't present that. We just stuck with these patterns, which we think are super cool. And um, we didn't have time for co-occurrences, which is correlational. So maybe you wanna say some, add something, Catherine? No, I think this is a step that um, we haven't taken yet, but I think we'd love to do in our next. What did you get though? What is, oh, we should have as far as, yeah. So I'll just, my gut all the way along for years is I'm really into the idea that these partnerships be trust, people get along, they're trying to do things. But I also kind of bought into the discussion that maybe some, a little too much symbolic stuff is going on. So I do have these gut responses, but all the way along, 
I'm seeing lots of authenticity and sincerity and trialing really hard across all sorts of different organization partnerships and the organizations they represent. Um, and so I do have gut reactions and we've run some co-occurrences, primarily co-occurrences. And again, co-occurrence means it could be on page one of a transcript and page four. Um, just means they co-occur. And surprisingly, we don't see co-occurrences between the type of partnership like I mentioned. And we don't seem to see them based upon who these people are, tribal, local government, landowners. My gut would have said, we're gonna see that. It would jump out. And so our initial foray in hitting co-occurrence, it was surprising. But we haven't, we're gonna do more interviews. And, but yes, my gut. <laughs> these are gut instincts and I'm, increasingly just very optimistic. So what is the science doing then? Is it educating them about the problems that they care about? Or do you, what, what exactly do they need it for? Because I mean, policy, there's a factual basis. You can argue about the facts. They say the water isn't polluted, and you say it's polluted, okay? Or the, the species of fish are changing or not changing. So there's the factual reason that groups might disagree or need to have a consensus about something. And then there's the value. And so where does the science come in these groups? Is it one or the other? Or what? Uh, you want to go for it, Catherine? Repeat the question since people may not have heard. I think if I understand correctly, um, as far as where does the science come in and how are, what is the value added, basically. Um, I think, so as far as instrumental, I think that what we see most of is using it to um, make, decide priorities. So this is like, you know, with the derelict vessel, they might be deciding which derelict vessel is the most important to move, right? What's gonna make the biggest difference? Um, I also see, have seen it quite a bit used for monitoring. Right? And monitoring can be really valuable for evaluating performance and making changes. Right? And then as far as problem definition, um, I think this is just understanding things like the severity of a problem. So perhaps identifying projects that they want to propose. Right? This could also be, um, this is interesting because you know, this could be you know, if like an, a marine resource council is going to propose that um, a public agency does something, right? they may be looking at kind of how big of a problem is this, does this justify attention? Right? The one, just to add, the one thing we can't say, we can, we can hear what they're telling us about why they want it, what they're running into, how they use it, and we don't see diversity across types of partnerships or their members, but what we can't, and we know they're advising stakeholders and, their, and policymakers, often local elected officials, but to what end? Do the local um, elected officials or the planning board um, what's the uptake? And that's um, two years from now or something, we might start interviewing those people. But what's really cool, I think, is just how it's being used and transported. They're acting as what the literature calls boundary organizations. That's the language for science transport. And so we can see how it moves and why, um, but to what end? It's clear to what end they are saying they're doing it for, but what is the ultimate impact? Um, this is something I've studied about collaborative partnerships in many other ways, um, but. Well, you put it in the realm of citizen science. There is a realm of citizen science in which they take purple air monitors. Right? So that's a big deal around here. Uh, wildfire smoke, etc. And we've just seen in the last six to eight years proliferation of people getting air monitors and then you can link it in. And so citizen science is collecting information that the EPA could not collect at that scale. Um, and, and so that doesn't take a collaboration or a partnership, right? Correct. So what is it what, when would you cross the threshold into a partnership in order to collect information? Or is it always that 
you're in a partnership, you want to accomplish something, and you're, you're going to get the information from wherever you... So what, what in this spectrum of different types of uh, citizen science, is the function, do you, do you think that it's a different function for the Purple Air Monitor than for these collaborative efforts? And yeah. so what would it be? So the question is where citizen science comes in. Some people refer to it as community science because it's at the community level. And so Bruce gave the example of collecting health data, but you don't necessarily need a partnership for that. You need to spread the technology and do some training so the agency can do it. Partnerships are often coming together to and that, the, the problem's already stated, and they know what they want and why they're going to do it. They just need help. Um, the community science stuff doesn't usually lead to a partnership. These are all sorts of stakeholders, agencies, private actors, nonprofits, coming together to scope the problem, figure out how to address it. And in that process, they need to get data. And then they might create a community science platform or tag along to somebody else's and co-produce it. Um, so Catherine showed you the data on co-production, which is not itself always community science. Um, it might be multi-agency. I just spoke for you, but I don't know if you want to add any, disagree with me. <laughs> so is it the case that when you have these organizations, that they already know that it's a bad idea and they want to get rid of ships? Or is it that they need to collect enough evidence about how it's polluting before they can get anybody to act? What, what exactly is the relationship between what you're learning and what you want to accomplish with, with respect to this very specific example of abandoned ships? You want to go for that one? Yeah, so correct me if I misunderstood, but what is, how is science used in that example, for instance? I would, I would not put it that way, that there aren't organizations that deal with abandoned ships, but there are people who care and want to get these ships out. Likewise, there's a lot of pylons from old structures where the docks and, um, went away, but the pylons remain, and you want to remove those, there's sea life on it. What's the problem with an abandoned ship? Um, well, maybe it's leaking stuff, maybe it's rusting, but you know, maybe it actually might be okay because sea life will latch onto it, and then people will scuba dive around it. You know, it's one of these problem definitions. It's the scoping part that gets you to the instrumental part. And, but I wouldn't, I don't see that these groups come together for something that specific. They tend to come together for an area. Mm -hmm. Like we are really concerned about this estuary, in particular, how to manage ag use and hopefully work with farmers to rethink setbacks for cows rather than having the EPA try to tell them or somebody to move them back. And so, you know, it's more about something like an estuary or Half Moon Bay rather than the boat in Half Moon Bay. It's place-based often. Yes, very place-based yeah. from narrower to bigger, but there's this limit at which presume some scope would happen because people would have to drive and meet somewhere. Now things are changing with Zoom and so we, one interesting question is can the scope of these partnerships get bigger because now they don't necessarily have to meet. Kate. Do you have a sense of why the respondents rely less on academic literature than on gray literature sources? How can producers of academic peer-reviewed literature make it more useful to groups like you that you studied? I have my opinions. What's your opinion, Catherine? <laughs> I mean, of course, we saw that uh, like high subscription costs can be a big barrier. So just being able to, you know, access it. Um, but another thing is, you know, having academic research with key takeaways, perhaps implications, right? Um, I think that element can perhaps really help. Um, again, bridge that gap between research and practice, right? I think it's really cool when research articles have, for instance, like key takeaways, right, or implications. You know, if you're just reading through abstracts, that can help them sift through a lot faster, right? 
And some journals require that. They want that, those key takeaways right up front. And one of the problems with access to journals are these monster private corporations like a Solvier, which publish a lot of journals, they firewall the articles, and they're publishing federally and state funded research and charging for it. It's outrageous to me, my opinion. You know, they'll charge 25, 35 bucks an article that somebody can find on any internet search, particularly Google Scholar, and they click on it and they can get the abstract and it says, oh, here are the key takeaways, but I can't get it um, because I can't pay for it. But they can go to a friend, the friend might say, I think I know where to get it. There might be some workarounds. And what I always tell people, just contact the author. Contact me, I would be so happy to send it to you. And of course I'm not supposed to, nobody heard that. Because if it's published by a Sylvier or a number of these others that are making money off these journals, um, but there's these open access journals like Ecology and Society, which I published in, it's great. Um, they aren't charging money, they're open access, and then the authors have to pay some nominal fee to get typeset online. Um, those are super awesome. More of those the better, um, but unfortunately in libraries, like the University of Washington Library, when they, they, they'll they buy a whole bunch of journal descriptions, like we're gonna buy all of Elsevier's, all thousands of them, whatever they are, and they buy them as a cluster, but they require the university to firewall them. And unless you have a UW ID and you can come in and rake them, nobody goes to the library anymore, they're there. Um, so, you know, there's these simple fixes, and this is hope where, you know, when we get the practical implications for the NSF and have guidebooks. I mean, um, if you really are, want to be getting this information, just get an affiliation. Like this, get an affiliation with the Wayne Center at Stanford, for example, and you get a, you get a Stanford ID, presumably, and you get into this, and you just get, you find your... Right, you're making cake, very good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, get an affiliation with my school. We have a lot of affiliations for a lot of reasons. And once you get it, you get a UW Net ID, you're into the library system. Um, there's just all of these seemingly simple things once you start thinking about them. But um, I mean, people are finding the peer reviewed research, but they can't get past the abstract. And they feel like they can't contact the author. And I'm, I'm, my response is please. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Um, uh. So Bruce was asking about, there's not always a clean dividing line between the gray literature, primarily from government or nonprofit foundations or whatever, and act peer-reviewed academic for a couple of reasons. Some government publications are actually peer-reviewed and some, peer, some academic um, journals are not peer-reviewed as much as we want. So it starts to get, in a gray literature, in you know, this unclear area. But one of the things, at least one interviewer, one interviewee said that I remember I coded it, was we go to those government documents for their list of citations. Um, and we don't necessarily go to the government document for what's in it. We go, that's a search strategy. You know, aha, the Fish and Wildlife Service has this document on this. But we don't, that science isn't really useful. And then you know you go um, and do the bibliometrics. So yeah, it's 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 when somebody says we go to government documents, it doesn't mean they're deeply reading a document. It's not a perfectly fine line. Are there other ones online? So um, to reiterate, this is a great point and. Um, she clearly understands the newspapers in Washington State, but the suggestion is that we um, get some articles in or um, letters to the editor to let people know about what we're doing. And that's, that's a great suggestion because the end game is how are we gonna disseminate the stuff for practical use? So one possibility is we put something like that and we say, here's our platform we created and direct. Um, and I hadn't thought about that. Um, you know, we were thinking of less public ways to find these things and to help partnerships find each other. Because as, as Catherine noted, 
the Marine Resources Committee are county based, they're all over, but they don't necessarily talk to each other. They're networked with the local integrating organization and the community based ones in a, a watershed. So they all know each other. In fact, they often hop between them. I'm going to do this wild, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do both. Um, and so, what we want to try to do is create platforms and publishing something in the newspaper would help disseminate. It's a great idea. I'm laughing only because I've never thought of myself as writing something like that. So hopefully Catherine will. Great. That's a, that's a cool Should idea. Would we pull it together? Oh, we could. Uh, absolutely. And it's a common thing that scientists will do. Um, uh, we have a suggestion from Tom Kuntz. He says, Regarding how to disseminate scientific research, there is a nice outlet called The Conversation that does this, similar to a newspaper column. So our co-author and co-PII, Tom Koontz, just chimed in from New Zealand on a, on a place this could be done. I'm glad he's joined us. <laughs> he can critique me later if I got things he's correct. <laughs> he's missing the dinner. All right, thank you for coming. Thanks, Gavin.